Hello, everybody. My name is Gabe Terry, and I'll be chairing this presentation today. Uh, today, we have three students, Genevieve, Colin, and Karina, who are going to be presenting for us. They'll each have um, 10 minutes to present, and then after each presentation, there'll be a five-minute question and answer um, session that you can ask them any questions you may have. So first up, we have Genevieve Brindle. Genevieve Brindle is a current junior attending Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina as a third year's honor student. Wanting to explore the world of immunology and pathology, Genevieve naturally gravitated towards the world of forensic biology. Hoping to continue on her academic journey, she hopes to eventually attend graduate school to further her knowledge of the body and death, as well as better learning how to care for those affected by it. So Genevieve, whenever you're ready. Awesome, is this lecture coming up for everybody? Can everyone see the slideshow okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, awesome, thank you. If you're like me, I can imagine that you've spent countless nights thinking, wow, one day I too will die, wondering about the time, the whereabouts and so forth. At least I hope that you do, and then I won't sound nearly as crazy for my presentation. Hi, my name is Genevieve Brindle and I'm a current junior forensic biology student at Guilford College in Greensboro. Firstly, I would take a moment to realize that this presentation deals with sensitive topics to some people. Within this presentation, I plan to talk about yourself, your relationship to death and your own mortality. Even though this is a part of our lives, it is very understandable that this may be hard for some people. And I totally understand. I just thought it would be important to put a disclosure before the rest of the presentation. Growing up, like any kid coming of age, I was fascinated with the idea of death. Be it gothic subcultures, music, movies, etc., I couldn't get enough of it. So when I came to colleges to pick and majors to spend my life working in, forensic seemed like the most understandable option. However, I couldn't just spend my time in the sciences alone. I wanted to grow and expand in any way I possibly could. Due to my constant need for knowledge and avenues, I'm a current religious studies and theater minor. Why would this be important and necessary for my presentation? Well, in looking outside of the sciences, I found various pitfalls affecting those impacted by death that I never truly had time to investigate. These pitfalls and issues are what my presentation today is based on. My goal here today is to do some of the issues facing the mortuary business today to raise awareness for the longer with us. Although there are countless areas that death has impacted, today I'll be talking about the following environmental impacts, financial issues, ritual rights, and accessibility. These main four issues are given to us from the Order of the Good Death founded out of California, helping to try and compact stigma around the funeral industry and death self. Because of their efforts and knowledge, as well as other organizations like them, I'm able to bring this presentation to you today. Firstly, it's important to discuss our environmental impacts on the world that we as humans possess and feed into. Not only do we wreck the environment when we're alive, we also have the opportunity to ruin it when we pass away. For many of us in our families, burials seem like the easiest and most comprehensive way to deal with our loved ones. In picking this form of burial, we use nearly 2.3 billion tons of concrete, enough to roughly create a sidewalk from Earth to the moon about 28 times over. Along with that amount of concrete, we use roughly 4 million acres of forest in order to supply the casket wood. Just to put all of this into perspective, that's roughly the size of New Jersey if it was completely covered with nothing but forest. Surely, you say, cremation, cremation must be better. Well, I wish that I could say the answer is yes to you. However, through burning our bodies and using the machinery built to keep up with them, we generate enough energy to drive about halfway to the sun. So if you're looking for space travel, you could walk our previous cement sidewalk there or take your car for a drive. 
Either way, it'll probably do much less harm to the environment than our cur current funeral practices do. I also believe it's important to make a quick note on the use of formaldehyde and use of embalming a body. Formaldehyde is a naturally occurring organic compound typically written as CH2O and is incredibly cancerous, not only to the workers who use it, but to the ground that it's put into. About 800,000 gallons of formaldehyde annually end up in roughly 1 million acres of land across the United States. At low levels, breathing in formaldehyde can cause eye, nose, and throat irritation, but with higher levels, you risk skin rashes, shortness of breath, wheezing, and in some intense cases, cancer and even death. The bringing about of formaldehyde was kickstarted by the First World War when soldiers fighting long distances away needed to make it back home to their families in order for the families to bury the dead in the ways that they wished to. Bodies on their own are actually not dangerous to us, but the chemicals that many funeral homes put into them are. We no longer need to ship bodies the long distances that we once used to. Therefore, not only is this, this chemical extremely dangerous, it is extremely outdated. If these chemicals get into the soil surrounding the graves, they risk leaching into the water supply in nearby towns and essentially poisoning everyone within that radius. So what are some better options and what can we do about it? One of the most common modern age burials is that of cloth burials. Essentially, people have started to go back in time and look at our ancestors in the ways that they buried the dead before the invention of formaldehyde in the First World War. In this case, you would take the dead and wrap them in a cloth in a ritual setting and then place them into the ground, typically with as minimal impact to the environment as possible. Although this does help cut back on our environmental impacts from the steel and wood manufacturers, in some cases it can actually be more harmful to put a body back in the soil. For example, Placing a body underneath a tree may cause the soil to reject the body due to the body's vitamins and compounds being far too much for the soil to handle. A possible fix to this problem is that there are many scientists currently working out of the United States and abroad that are looking into ways of creating human fertilizer. Essentially, a chemical is injected into the body, which speeds up the idea of decomposition and makes the body easier to compound into the soil. This allows for you to get back to the earth after you've passed away without causing further issues down the line and also helping cut your environmental impact from out of high consumption, steel consumption, and deforestation. Secondly, let's talk about everyone's least favorite topic, finances. Within the United States, the average cost of a funeral is roughly $7,300 as of 2022. Many experience the idea of funeral poverty, which is essentially the mentality of what you can forfeit from your family in order to pay off a funeral loan. You start to pay back these loans by getting out more loans and you begin to spiral and the pattern continues. Many families that say that an unexpected death could put them months in debt, if not possibly for the rest of their lives, depending on their financial income. Funerals are so expensive, in fact, that many communities in rural parts of America or lower income parts of America cannot afford them. They start GoFundMes, car washes, bake sales, any way to try and make ends meet. Death is not only taxing on your wallet, it's taxing on your emotions as well, and many funeral parlors know this information. Many can speak to the how certain salespeople would talk them in times of need to get them to buy things that they feel like they needed more. Why go for the standard casket when you can go for the red velvet lined one instead? Thirdly, ritual. Unlike financial and environmental, ritual is different for all of us. Some of us may not even think of ourselves as having a death ritual within our families. For this part of the presentation, I would like you to think back on your family and what you do in times of grief. Caitlin Dowdy, who is one of the main organizers from the Order of the Good Death, which I mentioned earlier, shares with us this quote from her website. Funerals once took place in the family home, facilitated by the surrounding community. The early 20th century saw the rise of the death industry, replacing family funerals with companies and professional technicians. Turning death into a financial transaction leads to care that is profit-centered rather than human-centered, with the corp itself becoming a commodity. The funeral industrial complex leaves little room for direct meaningful involvement and has robbed the family of valuable hands-on engagement and ritual. Death has become a profitable business instead of a time to allow yourself to grieve with those around you and process what's happened. We as humans have a fundamental right to grieve and process the emotions that come to us with, with many new age funeral industry practices, we are made to speed up the process, hand over our wallets, and continue on without our day. 
within the time slotted for this presentation or possibly when you leave and go home about the rest of your day. Think about what ritual means to you. How do you handle death? Do you have any ceremonies that come to mind? And does the rest of your family agree with you? Or if not, is it important that they do? Or are you comfortable enough in your own ritual to be fine with whatever outcome? Lastly, the idea of access. In a society, we talk about how no matter what happens while you're alive, everyone is equal in death. However, even when looking in the real wor world and the ways in which we process, this could be anything but farther from the truth. Depending on your gender expression, race, disability, socioeconomic status, et cetera, your access to affordable or accessible death care may be different from the person who's sitting beside you. The idea of being death positive is not just a catchphrase, it's a true movement towards social justice and equality during some of our hardest times. By looking at environmental factors, financial factors, the idea of ritual and accessibility to others and being able to critique them, we can strive and look forward to a more overall inclusive and less emotionally exhausting idea about death. So what can you do? All of this to say, what can you do to fix the problems going on within the funeral industry? The first and most important step, however, one of the most difficult steps to take is understanding your own mortality. Realize that one day you will die. You can't stop it, and it is inevitable. But why is it important to realize our own mortality? Many of us live our lives with the idea of death shut off from our minds. There's so many other things going on that you don't wanna worry about it. What happens after? What will happen to my family? And did I live the fulfilling life that I hoped that I did? And for the time being, it helps. However, shutting ourselves off to the idea of death only opens the floodgates for us not knowing what to do when it does come to us. If you break this mentality that death isn't real or it's not something that'll find me until much later in my life, it may surprise you that you'd actually live a much more fulfilling life. For example, if you acknowledge your own mortality and your time on this earth and don't let it control you, studies show that those in tune with this side of themselves live happier and grounded lives. You know that one day you will die, so you go out and do the things you've always wanted to do, instead of staying home terrified that it might happen at any given moment. Instead of living life to the fullest, you end up holding yourself back, not being able to come to terms that you truly only get one chance. But now you've acknowledged that you will die, but you don't want to sit in your room thinking about it 24-7. What's the next best step for you? Since many of us are afraid to acknowledge our own death, we never truly create a will or a death plan for ourselves to give to those who may outlive us. In creating a plan with nothing up for interpretation, you're able to receive all of the things you wish for after you pass away. Make a will and get it notarized before you pass away. That way there's no shocks to those after you and there's nothing left for them to think about. Death is not something to be feared, but instead is simply a fact of life as crazy as that sounds. If we as a collective start a death positive movement to help the environment, our families and ourselves, I feel like we will truly live in a more uplifting and inspiring world. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we're gonna now open up the floor for any questions. So if you have a question, uh, make sure you uh, raise your hand and I will get to each of you as I see your hands. Uh, I believe I see Christian first. Go ahead. I was, that was applause, but I'll definitely offer a question too. Um, so really nicely done. Um, <laughs> um, what, what is the most common reaction you get to people um, when you start to tell them that nothing we really do around death makes any sense? Like, what is the typical reaction you get? Um, not great. <laughs> um, it's one of the things that not a lot of people talk about. And through my work in forensic biology, like in my thesis and continuing on with my education, it's something I really want to change and break the barrier of discussion. Um, because many don't talk about it, or if they do talk about it, it always has a negative stigma assigned to it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to think that a lot of the things that are associated with death are always negative, And that's not a really a knowledgeable framework that a lot of people have. Um, so typically when I enter into conversations and tell people that I surround myself with death and I surround myself with the funeral industry, 
a lot of people ask me like why it must be so depressing and sad all the time but I actually find a really positive influence on my own life looking at my studies and also being able to say like this might be coming one day, but I should be able to savor the moment while I have it. And then once I tell people that part of my, um, like my studies and everything, it shifts to a much more positive lens. So that's one of the main reasons I'm here also today. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, when listening to your presentation and I'm um, reading your paper, the one thing that really kind of stood out to me was when you were talking about the soil rejecting the body. What exactly does that mean? So soil itself can either be, um, has different stages, whether it's basic or more acidic, depending on what parts of the United States or world we're in, or what like, um, whether you're like a forest or in parts of the um, and stuff like that. Um, so essentially, when you put yourself back into the soil, you go through different stages of decomposition, and your body tends to blow in change chemically, um, depending on, of course, what time you pass away, the temperature, and things like that. So if you put your body as it is into the ground, your blowing and the way in which you um, decompose can add more nutrients to the soil than is able for it to um, live with. So if the soil is already basic, and you, you add your body to the soil, it could change the entire makeup of the soil to a more acidic one and essentially could kill all of the plants around it. So unless you either um, go through cremation and then bury that there, or if you go through different scientific processes they're working on um, in which you can get buried um, in more like environmentally friendly caskets. I saw one recently about uh, mushrooms and moss being buried around you to try and balance out the pH of the soil. Um, so unless you do something like that, typically there's a very high chance that it will end up killing some of the vegetation around your burial. Um, so if you're like one of the main signs with forensic biology, looking out in the woods, um, if you see a patch of dead grass or grass that does not seem to the same health as other ones around it, there's a higher chance that someone might be buried there. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, looking to see if I see any hands. Uh, since I don't, I'll go ahead and ask a final question for you. So you talked about um, four areas of concern when it comes to um, death. Uh, which area of concern do you think is the most um, harmful or the most the one that's most urgent for us to address? Um, looking at the different climate change things happening right now, I would probably say environmental, just because it feeds into other parts of uh, social work that's happening right now. Um, I also feel like, for me, financial is also a big strain, just because of how it can have an impact on every other part of family life and how a lot of death work and mortuary issues are interdisciplinary. So even though it might just be looking at finances for a family, it can also trickle into what jobs or income you have, housing security, food security, and things like that. So I would say either environmental for a more scientific climate change point of view, and then financial for looking after families and their impacts. Thank you so much, Genevieve. Our next presenter is Colin LeBute. Colin LeBute is a senior majoring in economics and business administration at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He is a member of the disciplinary honors track in Lloyd International Honors College and currently works as a research assistant in the Department of Economics for a project examining health utility. All right, Colin, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Um, can everybody see the, the PowerPoint? I can see it. Okay. Hello, my name is Colin Butte, and today I will be talking about alcohol consumption, health-related quality of life, 
in the COVID-19 pandemic. First, I would like to thank my research team, uh, including Dr. Eve Wittenberg and um, Dr. Jeremy Bray. Before I begin talking about my study, an important term that I would like to discuss is health-related quality of life. This term will come up in my presentation quite frequently. Health-related quality of life is a person's perceived physical and mental health. It's measured on a zero to one scale with zero being representative of death and one representative of perfect health. For reference, the pre-pandemic health-related quality of life of the US population was measured at 0 0.79. So what do we know before um, we, uh, we began the study? As mentioned in the previous slide, we knew that pre-pandemic health-related quality of life was measured at 0 0.79. We also know from, Bar from Barbosa at all 2020 that alcohol sales increased by 14% from 2019 to 2020. The report suggests um, mixed results in consumption of alcohol during the pandemic as Barbosa et al. cites that it increased where other reports in certain demographics suggested um, that alcohol consumption decreased. What we also know through, through pre-pandemic analysis is that low-risk drinking yielded the highest health-related quality of life, while abstinence, medium, and high-risk drinking Yielded, the, um, yielded a lower health-related quality of life. The study aimed to measure four objectives. Firstly, we wanted to collect health-related quality of life data throughout the course of, of the pandemic. Secondly, we wanted to analyze the alcohol consumption patterns during the pandemic. Thirdly, evaluate the relationship between health-related quality of life and alcohol consumption. And lastly, compare our measurements with, with, with pre-pandemic data. We used the, the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions 3, or NISARC 3, for our pre-pandemic data. Um, NISARC 3 was administered during the years of 2012 and 2013, and it consisted of 36,309 total participants. As mentioned before, we use this for our pre-pandemic data and similar variables were pulled between our survey and NISARC-3 to compare between pre-pandemic and during pandemic. In both NISARC-3 and our survey, we used a survey health instrument called the SF-12, which was used to measure respondents' physical and mental health. The SF-12 is a 12 um, question questionnaire that is used to measure health-related quality of life. The SF-60 is a scaling mechanism that is derived from the SF-12. The SF-60 uses a scaling metric that allows for more precise health-related quality of life predictions than the SF-12. For our survey, we used a 24-question primary analysis survey. 12 of the questions were the questions from the SF-12 questionnaire, and um, the other 12 questions were from our own knowledge. Um, the SF, um, as mentioned previously, the SF-12 questionnaire is used to measure health-related quality of life, and our 12 questions were used to assess alcohol consumption levels and COVID-19 impact um, related questions. Our survey was administered in three different waves, the first of which in December of 2020, second of which in March of 2021, and the third in August of 2021. Data from all three waves was grouped into one pooled data set with the NISARC-3 data. When turning to our analysis, we created a number of variables used to measure our um, results. 
The first variable was the SF60 score, which was derived from the SF12 questions and used to measure health related quality of life. This um, score was measured on a zero to one scale, zero being representative of death and one representative of perfect health. Our second variable created was World Health Organization's alcohol consumption risk levels. This variable defines limits on grams of alcohol consumed per day. We broke this up into five categories being no risk, low risk, medium risk, high risk, and very high risk. Our next variable was a change in drinking variable created to um, analyze the self-reported change in drinking since March 2020, 2020 or 2020's beginning um, of the pandemic. And this was broken into four categories, being never drinking during the pandemic or be before the pandemic, increased drinking during the pandemic, no change in drinking, and decreased or stopped drinking. We also created demographic variables for sex, age, and race slash uh, ethnicity. Multiple variables were created to assess COVID-19 related uh, impacts such as level of disruption from social distancing and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the respondents' health. Looking at table one, this was our sample characteristics of the population. So in our survey, we had 3,125 um, participants. And as you can see from the chart of our demographic variables, um, our, def our demographic variables replicated the US population weighted proportions. In the highlighted portion at the bottom, 95% of our respondents were classified as non-drinkers or low-risk drinkers. When looking at the survey responses for self-reported drinking, we found that 30% of our sample reported as never drinking, 23% reported as decreased or stopped drinking, 28% had no change in their drinking habits, and 16% increased their drinking. When looking at the COVID-19 pandemic impact questions, um, these three were the most notable but, um, dis with disruption from the pandemic Overall, 72% of our respondents reported a moderate to extreme impact from the pandemic. 47% um, reported a moderate to extreme impact on their own health. 77% reported a moderate to extreme level of disruption due to social distancing. For our analysis, we used a multivariable linear regression model that was used to examine the relationship between alcohol consumption level and health-related quality of life. In the first row shows pre-pandemic data that showed the previously mentioned established relationship between low-risk drinkers and having a, a higher health-related quality of life. Here, you see that low-risk drinkers reported having a 0.0198 higher health-related quality of life. As for change in drinking, we found that those who increased their drinking had a 0.037 lower health-related quality of life during the pandemic. Additionally, those who decreased or stopped drinking had a 0.024 lower health-related quality of life. However, those that um, those did not those who did not change their drinking habits had a higher relative health-related quality of life at 0.0168. For overall COVID-19 impact, we found that those who were a little bit or moderately affected had a lower health-related quality of life of 0.0706, and those who were quite a bit to extremely uh, um, affected had a lower health-related quality of life of 0.1256. When looking at this graph in the first columns, um, to the left, that is the pre-pandemic health-related quality of life of 0 0.79. The middle column is the um, pandemic time health-related quality of life of 0 0.72. And the last column in yellow is the health-related quality of life for each of these situations. To put, to put this in perspective, um, this means that those who increase their drinking 
averaged a health-related quality of life of 0.68 during the pandemic. Those who decreased or stopped their drinking had a 0.7 health-related quality of life, and those who had no change in their drinking had a 0.74 health-related quality of life. Those a little bit to moderately affected by the pandemic had a health-related quality of life of 0.65, and those quite a bit too extremely affected had a 0.59 health-related quality of life. So in conclusion, we found that a lower health-related quality of life is associated with any change in drinking during the pandemic and a much lower health-related quality of life with the impact of the pandemic. These changes in drinking during the pandemic may, the, may be the result of a lower health-related quality of life, but, but we need to farther analyze and research um, the situation primarily over a longer period um, that the pandemic has been going on. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today on alcohol consumption, health-related quality of life, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you much, so much, Colin. Um, I'm going to now open the floor up to any questions. Um, if you have a question from Colin, please make sure um, you raise your hand on there. I'll go ahead and start with the question for you. Um, I'm looking at, at your sample size and you have a pretty decent um, sample size for your um, survey. Uh, my question is, how did you reach out to participants and how are they selected for this specific survey? Yeah, um, so our participants were fielded through a group called um, NORC and it's based um, from Chicago and our research team has a partnership um, with NORC and they field um, their participants out of a um, non-institutionalized uh, adult from the age of um, 21 for our sample because it involved um, um, the alcohol consumption. Um, so 21 plus. Thank you. All right. Um... Dr. Dr. Mute. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for your presentation. So I'm I, I'm not a, um, a scientist, so my, my question is a little bit more on the interpretation side. Um, I feel like this is the pandemic is going to offer a wealth of different research opportunities going forward. So my question is more about the longitudinality of the study, if that's even a word. I mean, are you planning on following up with the same group of people to see if the if the effects are going to compound or, you know, now that the pandemic is quote unquote ending, and I'd say that, you know, different people have opinions about whether or not this is really, we're coming to an end of this phase in our kind of social experiment. So what are your thoughts on that and on extending this out? Yeah, um, that was something that we have thought about in the research team is to follow up um, now. Um, I guess the only um, apprehension that we had, which was a limitation in this study, um, was that changes in drinking are normally self-reported. So um, now that we're going on two years with the pandemic, um, it's very hard to recall what your drinking habits were two years ago. Um, so we thought about pushing or about spreading the waves out more, but we decided to um, kind of comprise them more together so that there'd be a fresher recall. I'm wondering what got you interested in this specific topic as it relates to COVID-19? Yeah, so I think it's a um, um, area that interested me is because we all we all went through um, quarantine and lockdown um, as a country, but as the world together. And so I think that um, we also know that this study branches on more than um, um, just the alcohol consumption, but just health of the population together. And for us, um, we haven't really experienced what a pandemic or being in lockdown um, is like, um, like in our entire lives. So I think this was a representation of what we can do going forward if 
um, a pandemic were to happen again or natural disasters, uh, how can we predict ways to mitigate and um, um, try to find solutions knowing that this previous research is there? So I think for me, that was um, interesting to see going forward, how can we adjust um, our, our limitations to, to really analyze what's going on in the world. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one more question. All right, so I'm gonna ask you about your waves. You said you had three waves of um, data collection. Um, was it the same questions given to different groups of people or how, how were the three, what differentiated the three waves of data collection? Um, primarily the three waves of data collection were uh, differentiated by their time period. Um, it was the um, same group of people within the NORC that, that took, or sorry, it was different people within the group of NORC that took it, but under the same organization. Um, but primarily the time and, and place, um, our ways were actually hit the pandemic at very interesting times with December, 2020 um, being um, COVID being very prevalent. It's hard to remember back because it's only ups and downs, but in, in December, 2020 COVID was very prevalent. And then in um, the April of 2021 was when the vaccine was first launched and numbers were on the decline. So we actually uh, had a little bit of hope coming out, but then in August 2020, 2021 was when the Delta variant hit. So um, it was very interesting in how we timed our waves because the perception of uh, how the pandemic was changing, I think uh, could have influenced some of the answers. Thank you so much, Colin. You're welcome. Thank you. Our final presenter today is Karina Johnson. Karina Johnson is a junior kinesi kinesiology major at UNCG. Karina is a full honor student in Lloyd International Honors College, being a member of both the international and disciplinary honors tracks. All right, Karina, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Just one sec. Okay, I think I have my screen shared. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not sure how the screen sharing works. Okay, so when you think about weightlifting, you probably think about the stereotypical weightlifter that looks like this or this or this. Well, what if I told you that women weightlift as well? Now you're probably thinking that the stereotypical women weightlifter looks like this. Now, what if I told you that you as a woman can weightlift and make changes to your body like this? and this. Hi, I'm Karina Johnson and I'm a junior kinesiology major at UNCG and today I'm going to talk to you about why you should weightlift but specifically why women should weightlift. Weightlifting is discouraging to many people but I feel why it's so discouraging for women is because they're afraid that when they weightlift they're going to look too manly or too bulky. So that treatments and vitamins to achieve this goal. Contrary to popular belief, it is physiologically impossible for women to look manly. Men produce more testosterone than women. This means that men have greater and quicker muscle growth than women do. Men also have larger muscle fibers in their upper body, while women normally have larger muscle fibers in their lower body. Despite the frequency and intensity of your strength training program, you're always gonna have some sort of fat mass on your body. Men typically develop fat deposit in their stomach, while women typically develop fat deposit in their hip, glute, and thigh region. 
This suggests that women will normally maintain a curvy shape when it comes to weightlifting. These physiological components contradict the stereotype that women will look manly whenever they start program. Okay. Another reason why women are so discouraged by going to the free weight section is because weightlifting is stereotypically a man's sport. In a study done by a sports and exercise behaviorist named Kimberly Hurley, for every one woman in the free weight section, there are 27 men in the free weight section as well. But I don't want the male population to steer you away from the gym. But instead, I want you to listen to all of these amazing physical health benefits to encourage you to go to the free weight section alongside them. Weightlifting has many physical health benefits. Metabolic syndromes such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol are all risk factors of developing cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in women in the United States. Weightlifting can reduce your risk of developing cardiovascular disease by decreasing the risk and reversing some of these metabolic syndromes that I've mentioned. In a journal article written by a fitness researcher named Dr. Westcott, the high volume and high intensity training of a weightlifting program directly attacks the abdominal fat that is directly linked to insulin resistance level and glucose intolerance. This allows for the reversal of a diabetes diagnosis. In terms of high cholesterol, weightlifting can reverse that too. In our bodies, we have good cholesterol, which is high density lipids, and low cholesterol, which is low density lipids. According to Dr. Westcott, good cholesterol can increase up to 21% with weightlifting, while bad cholesterol can decrease up to 23%. So if you're suffering from any kind of metabolic syndrome, I highly suggest that you give weightlifting a chance so you can potentially have a life without taking your blood pressure medication or taking your insulin. During weightlifting, your heart rate rises above normal levels. If you think about it, your heart is a muscle too. So every time you're weightlifting, your heart is contracting and your heart rate is increasing. And the more rapidly your heart is contracting, the more stronger and the thicker that your heart becomes. So weightlifting conditions your heart and in turn um, decreases your blood pressure and decreases your heart rate because it takes less effort to pump all of that blood blood to the rest of your body. Okay, so we've talked about how weightlifting can improve your insulin levels, improve your cholesterol, improve your blood pressure, and strengthen your heart cells. Now we're going to move on to our muscle and bone cells. In addition to heart disease, as women age, we are more prone than men of developing osteoporosis and sarcopenia. Now, you probably heard these names as some kind of random medication infomercial, but I'm going to break it down for you. Sarcopenia is the loss of muscle mass, while osteoporosis is the weakening and brittling of bones. According to Dr. Westcott, resistance training reduces the risk of developing sarcopenia by increasing the production and function of the muscle cells, which promotes an increase in muscle mass. If you look at these pictures, the picture on the right, that's somebody with sarcopenia, as you see, is a lot less white, which means that they have a lot less muscle tone. And on the left is somebody who has a lot more muscle tone, and a lot more muscle cells, which is the results that you can get if you begin weightlifting. Having a lot of muscle mass is a good thing, especially from a wider health standpoint. Having more muscle mass than fat mass is good because excess fat mass is, has been proven to be linked to a series of diseases and conditions such as those metabolic conditions I mentioned earlier. Similarly, weightlifting reduces the risk of developing osteoporosis because it increases the production of bone cells and strengthening our bones, preventing fractures and break in the, breaks in the future. Uh, once again, if you look at the picture on the screen, picture on the right is a bone with osteoporosis and the bone on the left is a healthy bone. Um, the bone with osteoporosis has a lot more brownish gray in it. That means it's a lot more porous and it has a lot less bone cells than the bone on the left. By weightlifting, you can make that difference in your bones. Now tell me that weightlifting doesn't sound like its own sort of drug. Most of these health conditions, women are more at risk of developing than men, but weightlifting can improve your physical health by either reversing or decreasing all of these disease risk factors. So I encourage you to overcome your fear, go to your local gym, get that membership, and go to the free weight section and try weightlifting today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Karina. Um, just as before, you have five minutes uh, for questions. So if anyone here has uh, any questions for Karina, feel free to raise your hand um, and I will get them as they come in. I, I see Dr. Mewt has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. I really love that you um, included some of the kind of sociological factors that go into, into uh, how we perceive being in the gym. So as someone who, and I'm, I'm sure many of us are, have at least been to a gym once, we kind of, you get a sense of gym culture, you sort of know who goes where, and it is a very gendered space. Like you walk in and you know where the guys go and you know what kind of machines women are you know, supposed to use and they're mostly the elliptical machines. So it's kind of interesting how we all kind of, we've you know, acculturated to this, this space and these ideas. So what tips do you have to sort of break us out when we walk into those spaces um, how do you, what tips do you have to kind of convince us to get out of those, those grooves, those kind of acculturated ideas that we have about, you know, who's supposed to use what or be where in a gym? So when you walk into the gym, you see like all of the options. And I say to just go whatever you're most comfortable for. If you're most comfortable with the cardio machines, then I just recommend starting your warm up with the cardio machines. And Squat rack and do like four pound, four hundred pounds that you see other people doing. But there's also dumbbells and there's also um, machine assisted weights as well. So you can start easy with dumbbells and lightweight. A lot of people like to start with the free weight machines because you get to feel the muscles that you're targeting being free weights. So um, I say, you know, start with what you're comfortable with and start with the dumbbells and free weights or machine weights before you head to the free weights. I'm curious about um, something about it. This seemed really targeted towards an audience that would be very in tune with um, their health conditions. But how would you suggest getting someone, some of our younger generation, started on weightlifting or you know appropriate amount of weightlifting, so that way those concerns are lowered even more? But incorporated um, weightlifting into our physical education program more. I know in North Carolina, physical education is a requirement for you to graduate high school. And in my high school, um, we did and then we got to practice bench press, and we got to practice chest press, and like lunges and leg press. Great weightlifting in our um, education program. It could help a lot of our younger audience start to do it as well. Well, all right. We have time for one more question. All right. So, what got you interested in um, weightlifting and in regards to women's health? Um, yes. So I've always been interested in physical activity. Growing up, I played softball. Um, but once I got to college, I stopped playing softball. People still cardio. Everybody, you look on campus, everybody's going on a run. And cardio is just something that I'm just not very in tune with. So the main thing about physical activity is to do something that is interesting to you and fun to you. And I think weight, weightlifting is just such an interesting topic because there's so much variety. You have different types of weightlifters. You have people who just do it every day or you have the, the bodybuilders like I showed at the beginning of my presentation. So I just like the variety and um, yeah. I know I said it was the last question, but as soon as I started my question, the hand went up. Um, so I'm going to take the question okay. from Liz before we finish off. I don't ha know how to specifically like word this, but you like were saying how fat is stored differently for people that like um, they're assigned at birth as male versus female. So I was wondering like as a female, like if you should 
um, target a certain area compared to uh, like a male when you're first starting out? changes you want to make that women typically develop fat in the glute area it's not the same for everybody it's that's just the majority so if you want toner legs then you want to incorporate more lower body days in your workout than upper body days if you want you know a larger upper body like a lot of people want the hourglass shape then you want to work your upper body Fully. Um, so it all depends on what kind of shape you're going for and what kind of goals you have personally for your fitness plan. Thank you. Yeah. Once again, thank you to Genevieve, Colin, and Karina for their presentations today. Um, those of you who are judging this, uh, please make sure you get your scorecards filled out and turned in. Thank you everyone for this and great job to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.